Now, our perspective of life has changed considerably over the years. Dating back to the Renaissance, there was a considerable interest in understanding life by understanding anatomy. So dissections became very common because people were interested in understanding what did it mean to be alive by understanding how did an organ or how did a tissue function. So one of the common beliefs that has been held by people over thousands of years has actually been the principle of vitalism. Vitalism states that what happens in a living cell is unique to a living cell and can't be duplicated elsewhere in the universe. That idea was basically uh, proven to be false by the person shown on the screen, Frederick Wohler. Wohler was able to show, using ordinary chemistry, that he could make urea a compound that was known to be made by living organisms, and prior to his uh, discovery was believed only made to be possible by cells. Thanks to the discovery of vitalism, we now realize that what happens with cells is the same thing that happens in the rest of the universe, although perhaps in a different way. Now, the discoveries of life and the molecular nature of life have been totally dependent upon technology. The first technological advance that had importance in helping us to understand cells was the invention of the microscope. Anton von Leeuwenhoek in the 1650s invented the very first microscope, and he was the first person ever to see single-celled organisms, organisms that he called animalcules. He was very, very intrigued by these cells. Robert Hooke uh, made some significant improvements on the Van Leeuwenhoek microscope and was able to make some very interesting discoveries, including something that we carry forward today, which was the cell basis of life. His anatomical drawings of cork, as seen on the screen here, showed individual cells and reminded us that every living cell came from a previously living cell. By the 1850s, the discovery of uh, the molecules that are important for the molecular basis of life came into being. Friedrich Meischer in, uh, discovered a compound working in the 1850s that he called nuclein. Now, he was interested in studying proteins, but what he did was he isolated nuclei, and when he isolated nuclei of cells, he discovered it contained a substance that had some very unusual properties. He didn't know what those properties were, but he knew he had discovered something new and important that he called nuclein. We know today, of course, that nuclein is DNA. The Augustine monk Gregor Mendel was interested, and he was studying about the same time as Miescher. Gregor Mendel was interested in studying uh, the inheritance of traits from one generation of peas to another generation. And he made very, very careful studies, and in his studies realized that there was genetic information that was being transferred from one generation to the next, and further, that that genetic information had properties that he called recessiveness and dominance, traits that we associate with genes. Mendel's work was largely undiscovered for about 30 years, but when it became to be discovered, it was revealed as quite a revolutionary finding, certainly for its time. By the 1930s, the idea of the molecular basis of life started to come to fruition. Erwin Schrodinger, the famous physicist, wrote a book called What is Life? And in his book, he posed the question that the cell was not the most fundamental thing with respect to life. Instead, he said that the molecular basis of life was in molecules. That is, the basis of life was in molecules. And within those molecules, we could find every trait that would ever, be ha that would ever occur in biology. His idea was radical at the time, and it, but in fact, it had great influence over many people who later made giant discoveries, including Watson and Crick, in their discovery of DNA. We know today that Schrodinger was basically correct. That is, that life has a molecular basis. Avery McLeod and McCarty, and McCarty in 1944 did a series of experiments that proved definitively for the first time that the genetic information that was being transferred between generations of cells was in fact DNA. It, only a few years later in 1953, Watson and Crick, standing on the shoulders of giants and borrowing the data of Rosalind Franklin, were able to show for the first time the structure of DNA. The beautiful double helical molecule with the complementary bases inside was a revelation because upon seeing it, people quickly realized how one strand could specify the replication of another strand. And through that replication, genetic information could be transferred identically from one cell to the next generation. 
The central dogma states that DNA makes RNA makes protein, and that happens uh, because of the way information is transferred in cells. We've modified the central dogma since it was first described in the early 60s to incorporate some other things about RNA that we know today that we didn't know then. But the central dogma and its description of the transfer of information within cells is central to everything that we do, whether we're studying genomics, whether we're studying transcriptomics, whether we're studying metabolomics, the central dogma is as relevant today as it was when it was first described. Now, in concluding this talk, I want to leave you with some thoughts relevant to the structure of bacteria that I mentioned earlier. Excuse me for feeling superior to all of the lowly bacteria. You should know very well there is no organelle inside of their tiny interior. You just completed your first video of the world's best medical exam preparation. Lecturio brings the knowledge of worldwide leading medical experts and teaching award winners to your PC, tablet, or smartphone. Prepare yourself and check your progress with thousands of quiz questions, customized to USMLE standards. And the very best, you can get in touch with our medical experts personally. Visit Lecturio.com now and continue with the most inspiring medical education around the globe, anytime, anywhere.